like to welcome everyone to the Provincial Election All Candidates Night. The purpose of tonight's event is to give the residents and businesses of Trend Hills the opportunity to ask questions regarding current issues. I would like to now introduce the candidates. We'll start off with Kira Mees from the NDP party, Rob Milligan, Progressive Conservative Party, Lou Rinaldi, Liberal Party, and Gudrun Ludorf Weaver from the Green Party. Tonight's format is as follows. We'll start by asking the candidates to respond to an opening question in lieu of opening remarks. Three minutes will be allotted to each candidate for response. There will be a timekeeper who will monitor the times for all questions. A yellow card will indicate that 30 seconds remain, and a red card will signify that time is up. Timing will be strictly enforced. All candidates are to end their remarks immediately upon receiving the stop signal. Microphones will be shut off when time has expired. After the opening questions have been responded to, we will move into the written questions from the floor. Candidates will have one minute to respond. Again, please keep to the allotted time. Once all written questions have been read, we will proceed with questions from the floor. You will have 30 seconds to phrase your question, so please be clear and concise in what you're asking. Please also indicate if this question is one for, all, or one, for one or all candidates. If I'm not clear as to what you are asking, I'll paraphrase and repeat the question back to you before directing it to the candidates. They will have one minute to respond. Derogatory comments, interruptions, or unruly behavior from the audience or the candidates will not be tolerated. This type of behavior will result in you being asked to leave the meeting. With that, I'd like to get started. For our opening question, if you were to win the election, how would your government strategy affect the cost of electric power? What steps would your government take to deal with the generation and distribution of energy in this province? And we'll start with Mr. Milligan. Well, thank you very much. And uh, first off, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, this is a jam-packed uh, gymnasium, and uh, it's a little different from the last time we were here uh, two and a half years ago. Um, energy, of course, is the number one issue when I hear when I go around door knocking. Um, the residents uh, throughout Northumberland Quinney West are seeing their energy costs, uh, primarily their electricity costs, skyrocket uh, to the point where we have uh, individuals uh, who are uh, low income, uh, the working poor, and uh, seniors on fixed incomes who are at the point where they're going to potentially have to sell their homes uh, because they can't afford to pay their electricity bills. Um, also, manufacturing is, has been hugely affected by the skyrocketing cost of energy. Uh, and so, what we're looking at um, from our perspective and what we're proposing is uh, a couple of things that we need to do in order to make energy affordable here in Northumberland, Quinney West and throughout the province again and attract manufacturing back to Ontario. Uh, first and foremost, we would get rid of the Green Energy Act. Um, this is costing uh, manufacturers and yourselves as uh, ratepayers a billion dollars a year. Uh, this is coming from the Auditor General's report. This is an independent body. It's not our numbers. Uh, what that means is that uh, a lot of that funding, um, that cost, is shouldered by manufacturing. There's something called the global adjustment, and uh, there's one industry in, in, in Port Hope in particular, uh, ASCO, which is a foundry, uh, uses uh, between $16,000 and, 20, and, and $27,000 a month in their global adjustment. That's the fluctuation. So there's no, no stability for manufacturing, and this is a huge, uh, uh, a huge uh, cost. Uh, the other thing is the Liberal government has spent $20 billion dollars on implementing um, the Green Energy Act, uh, wind, uh, wind farms and solar farms. And what this means is that uh, it only produces, after spending $20 billion, less than 3% of the energy generated in the province of Ontario comes from wind and solar. So what does, how, how does this impact Ontario? Well, other jurisdictions are, are uh, producing electricity. We're paying electricity um, to, or other jurisdictions to take our surplus of electricity. So we need to broker a deal, and Tim has put me in charge of uh, brokering deals with uh, Quebec and Manitoba where we can get uh, energy online from them. Uh, for instance, Quebec is uh, ready to put three uh, hydro dams online. Thank you. 
Ms. Weaver. Thank you. Um, first of all, the Greens think that the best uh, energy in terms of cost is the energy that we don't use. So our platform supports conservation rather than consumption. And the political gimmicks about rebates really don't address that side of the question. So conserving energy puts money in your pocket and putting value in your home because uh, one of the things that we want to implement is a whole retrofit program so uh, we're going to call for legislation that will provide grants of up to $4,000 for you and a million other homeowners. And we'll propose legislation requiring local utilities to provide affordable loans for you to retrofit your house. And how are we going to pay for that? We're going to pay for that by cancelling the refurbishment of the expensive nuclear plants. Purchase low-cost water power from Quebec, and this is going to save us a billion dollars a year, and four billion invested in energy conversation, conservation over four years will create at least 56,000 jobs. So, retrofitting every building in the province for energy efficiency creates jobs, nurtures Ontario business pioneers in advanced energy technology, reduces power and energy costs, and attracts more business. So our basic platform is conserve, um, turn that light out, turn off that computer. You know, the old, the old ways are sometimes the best ways. Um, to be uh, uh, an electricity hog has a big, big price tag, not just for your pocketbook, but for the environment. The greenhouse gases that, that uh, are as a result of that uh, wreak havoc with our world, as uh, we are seeing daily. So it's a responsible way to deal with a crisis, is to conserve to be forward thinking and to make sure that the earth has a chance to survive. Thank you. Ms. Mees? Thank you. How am I? Am I good? Hello. It's nice to see everyone here tonight and um, I'm really happy to be here and to speak to you about the plan that Ontario NDP has for getting your electri electricity bills under control. And to start with, we, we do think that just putting a little bit of money back in your pocket is pretty important. And so a first step is taking the HST off of your electricity bills, the provincial portion, plus ending the uh, debt repayment charge. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but I think when we're trying to make ends meet, and like all of us are, I think an extra $200 in your pocket is a really a good place to start. And I think... We know that there are efficiencies to be found in our system, something that we have uh, been talking about for a long time and it's really important, is merging the entities of our hydro generation. We can save a lot of money by shrinking that bureaucracy and it, turning that savings back to the ratepayers. And uh, another thing would be capping the salaries of the CEOs and ending bonuses at Hydro. And in terms of uh, generation, we really do need to get under control the fact that we are paying to give our power away. It just doesn't make sense. And so that has to stop and we need to end that practice and get better prices by negotiating um, direct trading. And in terms of the really important aspect that my green colleague is talking about is we do need to start making our own power. And so we are going to have uh, retrofit loans available to ratepayers that they can install solar panels and so that we can start saving energy ourselves, producing some of our own energy. So that money is going to, again, see that benefit on our bill. And finally, we just need to... Um, review those 
private-public partnerships that we hear so much about because on paper maybe they sound like a great plan but in the long run we are the ones who are on the hook with private companies making the profits and we have to we have to stop that because our generation needs to be publicly owned and publicly accountable. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, thank you. First of all, thanks to the Chamber for hosting us tonight. And thank you for coming out. Uh, I think it's great to see such a large crowd. If I remember last time I was here for this, uh, we had a handful of people. So this, is, this is good. So, um, from the Liberal perspective, uh, what, uh, what started some 10, 11 years ago and to carry on, we now have a modernized, uh, a modernized uh, uh, system, which frankly was uh, left uh, in, a, in a sad state from previous governments. So uh, transmission line especially, it's something that uh, a lot of investment needed to be done and uh, to eliminate some of the blackouts and brownouts that we've all experienced uh, in the uh, late uh, 1900s and early 2000s. Uh, yes, there is a, a extra energy produced in Ontario and it, uh, and it has been sold mostly to the United States. We've closed a coal, uh, coal generating plant which has also improved their health care of our communities to some great extent and by the end of this year there will be no more coal. Our green energy, the Green Energy Act is building a an, an healthy environment and I refer to a comment made by one of the students at uh, ENSS uh, Trent Campbell for debate the other day where they looked at the green energy uh, act as uh, an investment on their future. The, pro the microfit programs, and I'm sure you've all traveled along Northumberland County, you've seen a bunch of uh, uh, solar panels, that's creating a steady, uh, a steady um, income for, uh, for, for our farming community. Our seniors have seen and continue to see a continue uh, uh, a credit when they file their income tax to do with their energy costs. All of Ontario now has a 10% credit on their bill, and uh, you know and I know that uh, if uh, Mr. Hudak would form government uh, in three weeks' time, three weeks today, the 10% would disappear off your bill. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to the written questions from the floor. Um, the question, some of these questions are directed to specific candidates, but the other candidates will have an opportunity to respond to them as well. So we'll start off with a question to all candidates, and we'll begin with Ms. Mies. Skills training and access to post-secondary programs affects both the future incomes of young people as well as the ability of employers to find the talent they need. What would your government do to ensure rural youth have appropriate skills and that they can access relevant programs locally and affordably? Thank you. This is a, an issue near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think we really have a comprehensive plan, really starting even at elementary school. So we have pledged a, an open school fund because we understand how important our rural schools are. So there, uh, the NDP pledges a, a fund that's going to help school boards keep small community schools open and also help to fund the costs of staffing those schools so that we can use them for events like this, so that we can host community events and um, after school programs. We pledge to freeze tuition costs and also to make student loans um, interest free, which I think will help students get out into the world without the crushing debt of student loans that so many of us carry. And I think I'm going to stop before you flash that red thing at me, Don. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, the Greens have a pretty unique and simple perspective on the issue of the costs of schooling. And um, we think that having four separate boards is a little bit much in our day and age. So we propose one. So we would have only a public board, not a separate board. And this, this kind of made a lot of my friends uncomfortable because I have a teaching background and of course I have a lot of friends who are teachers for separate schools and it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm going to be out of a job. No, you're not. My school's going to close. No, it's not. 
what's going to happen is that the money that is used for all the duplicating of services is going to be eradicated. So that brings at least, where are my notes? Um, I think it's a billion dollars Thank you. back to back to Thank the you, Ms. Weaver. funding. Mr. Milligan. Well, thank you very much, and uh, this is a this is one of the key strategies that we're uh, looking forward to implement under the million jobs plan that uh, we've uh, put forward. Um, we know, for instance, there's going to be a huge shortage, upwards of 500,000 uh, openings or employment opportunities in the high skilled trades industry over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So, what we're proposing to do um, is to lower the apprenticeship ratio. Uh, from a three to one current ratio to a one to one ratio. Uh, when I go around and listen to small business owners in the skilled trades, whether they're plumbers, electricians, welders, pipe fitters, uh, they're saying, Rob, we have lots of work on the docket uh, and we could hire more apprentices uh, to help us get caught up and maybe get the, the skilled trades uh, training that they need, but they're not allowed to. I think this is important. We're going to work with the colleges to ensure that this happens, um, to make sure that uh, also within the high schools, as a former high school teacher. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Milligan. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, as you know, uh, since 2003, uh, trades have been reintroduced uh, slowly to, to high schools. So we got to know those kids have a sense. Uh, uh, that's something that was totally closed uh, in the past. Uh, there's a 30% uh, refund to, uh, to post-secondary education, uh, and, uh, and that's part of our platform, part of our move forward to make sure that we have, we make post-secondary as affordable as we can, So, because we know that the jobs of tomorrow are skilled jobs, and we should also know that the 30% will disappear on June 13, if, uh, if uh, Mr. Udak forms government. I think that that's a, a huge loss. Thank you. Thank you. This next question will start with Ms. Weaver. If your does your party think that the current policy regime surrounding farmland loss and farmland protection is adequate? What policy changes or initiatives would your government take to respond to this concern? Wow, that is such a huge issue. Um, I think that protecting our farmland is 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 one of the biggest priorities that the Green Party has. And one of the um, ideas is just to close the loopholes that exist where class one farmland can be expropriated to use, uh, to be used for other than farming. And the, the, the interesting thing is that there's only 0.5% farmland in Ontario so we need every acre that we can find and keep and not lose 365 a day, which is what we're doing. We're losing 365 acres daily of Ontario farmland. That's just not sustainable. So where, where is that going to end up when you, when you see developers um, able to... Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yes, well, thank you. Obviously, um, you know, uh, before I was elected, I was raising beef cattle, and now I just cash crop because my wife insists that, that that's the case <laughs> for time management reasons. But um, obviously, farming is, is uh, paramount uh, for myself, our community here, and Northumberland, uh, Queenie West. Uh, so obviously, the, the preservation of, of uh, farmland is essential. Uh, what we also need to do, though, is to ensure that there are farmers to actually farm the land. Um, so, you know, with the closure of Kempville, uh, college and the ag uh, courses there, um, that's quite disconcerting because if we don't have anyone who has the expertise to farm the land, pretty soon it's just going to be uh, used for development. So I have great concerns about that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rinaldi? Sure. Uh, you know, Ontario has some of the best farmland and the best farmers and the best food anywhere in the world and uh, sometimes we take that for granted. So uh, back in 2005 or six. The Green Belt was formed to stop the huge development around the GTA. Uh, not only that, uh, so that, and that land is uh, actively being farmed, so you're growing food close to home. Uh, that, the, the government of the day uh, provided $150 million risk management to 
to farmers to make sure that if they had a bad crop year, they'd have something to fall back on so that they could buy seeds for next year. And just this, uh, this week, uh, it's a $40 million a year commitment for the next 10, $40 million a year for the next 10 years to help the agricultural sector and uh, food processing so that we can grow and process our own food right here as close to home as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mies? Thanks. Um, obviously, here in Northumberland, Pinty West, uh, agriculture is a huge economic driver, and we have to protect that for our citizens. And I really think an important thing around that is making sure that it's a viable lifestyle for people, that we can ensure that young farmers want to take over, and that new people consider it a worthwhile field to get into. No, no pun intended there, sorry. Um, it's really important, and so we want to support that succession planning so that young farmers can move in and keep the farm viable, and that includes things like rural infrastructure and on-farm processing so that we can have that farm gate income. Thank you. Our next question is to all candidates. We'll start with Mr. Milligan. What is your party's platform with respect to the accessibility of health care and quality medical services to rural and small town residents? Is the current situation satisfactory and what would you improve? Yeah, this is another major concern, uh, obviously, uh, given the demographics of Northumberland and Quinney West and uh, a lot of retirees coming out to our uh, great region uh, to retire. Um, one of the things that um, we've seen and, uh, in, in healthcare and studies have shown, and there's a, a shift that um, people will actually um, improve after surgeries by, by uh, staying at home or having uh, care uh, give to them at home. One of the concerns that I have and what we're hearing about is the fact that uh, the foundations of that services that they want to provide are not here. And also what we're seeing is cuts um, to the Trenton Memorial Hospital, they lost their lab, um, so the ability for them uh, to, to do surgeries and so on uh, has been uh, greatly reduced, as well as the layoffs of three staff at uh, Northumberland Hills Hospital. Uh, we're lucky to have a great facility here in, in uh, Campbellford, and uh, we want to keep that uh, here. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi? Sure. Um, excellent question. So. Uh, there was a huge shortage of doctors and services in the hospital in 2003. My number, my number one call in my office was, where can I get a doctor? I was pleased to go to my doctor the other day and I seen a sign on a desk that says, the family health team in Trenton is looking for patients. I thought I'd never see that before. Your, your local hospital here has got the benefit of CAT scan. That's something that very small rural hospitals never had before. The uh, hospital in Coburg, not only a CAT scan, but it's also got an MRI. Family Health Teams, Community Health Center, which uh, my good friend here now works at. We make huge investment. Can, do we need to do better? Do we need to do more? Absolutely. Uh, so um, I think one needs to recognize that we've come a long, long way. Thank you. Ms. Mies? This is not a one-minute question, but my one-minute answer is we need to do better. Uh, this, the state of health care, there's, there's a lot of gaps. And those, those gaps are where people, the cracks that people fall into. And so we need to do some pretty important things. The NDP pledges to have the, the five day wait, wait time for home health care enforced. We want to end the, uh, the, the waiting list for acute care beds and long term care. And I hate that sign. And we, um, we want to open family health clinics that will be open 24 hours and hire 250 new nurse practitioners so that we can end the, the cut the wait time at ER in half. And I'd love to speak to you all about that in more detail later. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, I think for my part, having um, my daughter is married to a woman from the United States and she was just absolutely blown away by our health care system as compared to her experiences in the United States. So we're, we're proud of that. We're proud of the fact that we care for our communities. We're proud of the fact that we have a sense of compassion and responsibility, and that has to be the priority. So wait times, hire, oh darn, hiring uh, nurse practitioners to the, 
a much fuller extent than we have now. Those are some of our goals. Thank you. This question is directed at Mr. Rinaldi, but as I said earlier, each candidate will have the opportunity to respond. Mr. Rinaldi, if the mandatory Ontario pension plan is implemented, how will young adults with young families be able to afford it, some on a minimum wage, when they are barely able to make ends meet now? Good question. So, uh, as you know, uh, all provinces across Canada have been pushing the federal government to expand the, the, the CPP. Unfortunately, that's not the way they see things, and uh, so Ontario is taking the lead. And by the way, there's two other provinces that are quite very much engaged and some others um, looking on. Uh, there is a cost, absolutely. The maximum, if you're making $90,000 a year, 50% of that's 45 and 1.9% is about $700 a year contribution. But that, what at the end of the day, oh my God, but at the end of the day, uh, when uh, that matures or comes to full fruition, they'll, you'll be, they'll be able to retire twice with twice the amount of money they have now with CPP. I think that's a fantastic investment because they're going to only reinvest the money in the community because, you know, we all like to spend. So uh, I think it's something that's needed to protect our middle class and, 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 and the poor. Thank you. Ms. Mies? Um, I'd say this is an area where uh, Mr. Rinaldi and I tend to agree. Uh, this was a, a platform policy of the NDP in our last election. Uh, but I do think that the fact is that low-income families, this is really going to be uh, a stretch for them. And so I think, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge, and so I think that other measures are going to have to be put in place really to, in term, to ensure the affordability of this idea. And so I think, it's, uh, I think some work needs to be done on the idea, but I, I do uh, I think it's something. However, I really think the long term, the big picture plan is getting the federal government online and making C CCP something that is actually going to sustain us in our time of retirement. Thank you. Ms. Well, saving is hard, um, no matter whether, I mean, I've earned very small amounts of money and I've earned lots and lots of money too, but saving is because you always have things that are going to eat into your, into your finances, but teaching people that that is a responsible thing that you need to do just as much as it is the government's responsibility to save for you as well. I think that is, is one of the things that we have to instill is that saving is a good thing. Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yeah, I'm proud to say that uh, I stood up in caucus and I was the very first uh, PC caucus member to do so and say that this is the sleeping giant that will kill any, any economic recovery in the province of Ontario or growth in the next 20 years or more. Um, it's going to cost uh, an individual, as Mr. Rinaldi pointed out, about $40 a week um, to invest in this and the employer as well. So what does this mean? It means that just in Northumberland uh, and Queenie West alone, that's about $118 million that is siphoned off of your local economy for your small businesses to expand on, to hire more individuals. In fact, their own financial experts have said it's going to cost 150,000 jobs in the province of Ontario if this is implemented. Mr. Flaherty knew it was wrong, and this is why the federal government hasn't moved on it at this time. Thank you. This next question is directed to Kira Mies. What is the status of the Wellness Centre for Trent Hills? And if elected, what will you do to get it going forward? Thank you. I'm happy to answer this question. It is, um, I'm happy to say that we're going to be having a, a photo uh, May 30th, I think, at the future site of the rec center here in Campbellford, and that the projects, um, the uh, other rec campuses in Hastings and Warkworth are moving along. Um, it's around two and a half million dollars, I think, of our seven million dollar goal that we have uh, set for ourselves with the Flourish campaign. Uh, I've been working on this project for, I don't know, about 10 years or so, plus or minus. Uh, I'm the Hastings co-chair of the Flourish campaign. It's a very important project to me, and I will work extraordinarily hard at Queen's Park to make sure that the provincial dollars that we need to complete this project are here. 
Did other candidates want to respond? Please. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, it's, it's a, f a fantastic question, and I can maybe speak with a little bit of experience. Uh, I mean, uh, and I'm glad to see uh, Mayor McMillan here and Councilor Brahami, that I've worked with them for, for eight years. Uh, you know, municipalities have projects, and, uh, uh, you know, and I always work on them to make sure they achieve their goals. So I'm just going to name a few. Uh, for example, the community health center, not sorry, the, the recreation center in, in Coburg, uh, we, I help bring that along. The um, YMCA in, in Quinty West, uh, I, I lobbied for that city to happen. The recent marina the mouth, at the mouth of the Trent system in Quinty West, it's happening. Uh, the sewage and water capacity, he, both here in Camelford, in Hastings, Merrick McMillan pleaded with me and, the, and we delivered. Uh, we need to deliver more, but certainly if, if, if it's something the community wants and it's, it's endorsed by, the, the, by council, I will, uh, I've delivered in the past and I hope to deliver again in the future. Thank you. Thank wow. you. Anyone else? Obviously, Ms. Mies. The, thank you. Uh, the Greens um, definitely want to see healthy, healthy children, healthy adults, healthy seniors, and you need to have some place where you can congregate and, and uh, socialize and, and, and uh, move and, and so on. So, Having recreation centers, um, not just for hockey, although that's important too. Um, we want we want that to be part of, of the program for municipalities to make that a priority for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, as as uh, an elected uh, representative, whoever is fortunate enough to be the representative, have to work in, in partnerships with our municipalities on initiatives, on infrastructure and other means, of, um, whether it's a, a rec center or, or water and sewer or bridges and roads. Um, I mean, that's the, the role of government is to redistribute your money, your money uh, to make sure that um, your communities run successfully. So. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Rinaldi on this next question. Manufacturers have been closing and leaving Ontario. What is your proposed approach to support the development of job opportunities in rural Ontario and small towns? Well, excellent question. I think uh, you know manufacturers see it today, and it's not just Ontario. It's uh, probably all over North America because a lot of the manufacturing uh, is moving to uh, abroad, uh, you know, India and China, where they're only paying two dollars an hour for labor. What we have here is we have uh, we have to build an economy which is uh, you know highly educated. Uh, skilled workforce. Uh, one of the things that I did personally, which I'm proud of, I've, I've, I was able to establish an Eastern Ontario Development Fund to help industry, uh, to help industry get established and help also industry to grow. Unfortunately, the, uh, the opposition voted against those initiatives, but thank God for the NDP that supported it, and the fund is still in place and it's only been expanded. And that was to create jobs. I can personally, you know, uh, Take, want to take some responsibility in Northumberland, Queen West, uh, probably about seven or eight hundred jobs retained, seven or eight hundred jobs, uh, new jobs were created by that fund alone. It's important to partner with industry because it's a, a com we're competing with the world today. We're not just competing Thank in the next year. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Mies. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, job development is crucial uh, and it is one of the, the things that I'm hearing most when I'm out talking to people. And so uh, we have a plan that, uh, that does differ from my uh, liberal and conservative colleagues who are fond of tax cuts and hope that corporations will then just turn that money into jobs, but we've seen time and time again that that doesn't work. And so our job creation plan will actually create jobs. So that we will be rewarding uh, industries for creating jobs and investing in their in their businesses. So when they see fit to buy uh, machinery and expand their operations, then they will also be eligible for a manufacturer's tax credit. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, one of the things um, that I learned coming to this neck of the woods is that Ontario is really about small towns and about small businesses in those towns. As a matter of fact, in Ontario, there are 300,000 small businesses and it's those small businesses that helped us through the recession the big corporations um, 
in spite of the fact that they're getting uh, uh, tax exemptions, are, um, still need bailouts. And it's it's like BlackBerry. They're they're not they're not sustaining um, their model of employment. So what we want to do is double the employer health tax exemption from 450,000 to 900,000 for small businesses that are not uh, that have a payroll of under five million. So that's just one of our strategies. Thank you, Mr. Milligan. Yeah, obviously uh, manufacturing has, has been crippled in the last decade, and uh, as mentioned earlier, I pointed out energy is the number one job killer here in the, in the province of Ontario. Um, you know, uh, what, what we've seen is a band-aid solution by the current uh, government on uh, throwing money to small, mid-sized businesses. Um, what we want to do is, is cultivate an environment for and a level playing field for all businesses to expand and grow. Um, you know, uh, the, I'm proud to say that Tim stood up against uh, Chrysler when they asked the taxpayers of this province for $700 million after having five quarters of profits. The NDP supported it, the Liberals supported it, and the NDP and Liberals wanted to give a multinational business $700 million of your money. No, we need to invest in the high skilled trades like uh, we're, we're proposing, and that is going to help small businesses, particularly in rural Ontario. Thank you. This next question I'm going to allot two minutes for. We'll start with Ms. Weaver. What is your party's plans to balance the, the deficit and how long will it take? My gosh. <laughs> um, That's why you get two minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, balancing the deficit, wow, that's, that's so huge. I mean, when you consider that we're paying 5.5% interest and that each and every one of us in this room our portion is 20,000 bucks. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of money. And we need to uh, come up with, with some really strategic ways to, uh, to deal with that deficit. And um, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that the present situation is going to prove that that is uh, at the end result because of um, certain uh, issues with gas plants and uh, orange and um, other situations where uh, our budget has just uh, become outrageous. And um, I'm hoping that through the various uh, entrepreneurial um, incentives and supports that we give that uh, we don't want to cut. Cutting cutting health, cutting nurses, cutting hospitals, cutting um, teachers' jobs. Uh, I, I'm somehow not seeing that as a solution because those people whose, whose jobs are lost, they're, they're going to have to go and, and get uh, employment insurance to, to manage. So it's, it's, it's really a waste of, of human potential to have to cut here, there, and slash this and that. So that won't be our strategy. Thank you, Mr. Milligan. Yeah, this is a this is a, a major. <laughs> it's all major. This is a very important election, <laughs> and it's good to see so many people out here. Yeah, what we're proposing obviously is the uh, is to bring back Ontario to a fiscal management position. Um, even even uh, Dwight Duncan, right, uh, the former Liberal finance minister, says that the current win government is on the wrong path. If you look at the last three budgets presented by Mr. McGinty and Mr. Duncan, it went from $13 billion to $12 billion to $9.8 billion, and then under Ms. Wynne, we, we've gone up to $11 billion, $12.5 billion, and, and uh, the 2014-15, we're looking at $13.5 billion, a deficit. But this is wrong. It has taken the Liberal government uh, under Ms. McGinty, Mr. McGinty and Ms. Wynne, uh, it took 23 premiers over 140 years to, to amass $130 billion provincial debt. This debt on, in the last 11 years under Mr. McGinty and Ms. Wynne has jumped to $289 billion. They are spending $2 million an hour on interest payments alone 
Two million dollars an hour just to service the interest on the provincial debt that they've incurred. That's two million dollars an hour that comes out of health care, infrastructure, education. I mean, I'm sure the municipality of Trent Hills would be very pleased if I said, I will give you five hours worth of interest payments to service whatever infrastructure you desire. Um, you know, uh, so what we're looking at here is uh, a bloated bureaucracy. We've seen since uh, 2009 almost 400,000 bureaucrats hired by Ms. Lynn. Um, we're looking at uh, cutting some of the fat off of those uh, bureaucrats. The Ontario Power <coughs> Authority, for instance, started out with 17 individuals. It's grown to over 2,300, and 80% uh, of them are making over $150,000. The CAO last year made almost $400,000, and what do they do? We're going to get rid of them. We're going to get rid of the Thank men. you. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, thank you. So uh, the, the target date is 1718, and uh, what the experts tell me that that's on target. Uh, there's been a world recession, not a, a, a North American West recession, a recession, not in Ontario, not a Canadian. Ontario is faring better than most other provinces across the country and, not, and the U.S. in the recovery piece. Uh, but the tar so the target is 1718. We talk about the, you know, the, massive def the massive deficit. We certainly have a massive deficit that every party contributed to. During good times, which you need to remember, it, under the previous government, there was a $5.5 billion debt, which today, they still not acknowledged, but the Auditor General said that they left behind a $5.5 billion debt uh, when the times were good, when all the, when all the cylinders were firing. So I would just say that you know, it's not only Ontario. We're recovering faster than, than the whole of Canada put together in percentages. Uh, just last month, uh, there was 25,000 new jobs created. Last year, there were 95,000 new jobs created. Uh, so the recovery, uh, you know, it's never fast enough, right? I mean, you know, it's, hard, it's hard to because we all want to be a step ahead. So uh, we're, we're moving the right direction, but by cutting 100,000 jobs, we're going to take 100 steps backwards. Thank you. Ms. Mies? So our, um, our fully costed budget uh, came out today, so I'm not sure if you would have had a chance to see it, um, but you can uh, visit our website, um, ourplan.ontarioNDP.ca, to see the fully costed plan. Uh, our plan is to balance the budget by 2017-18. And I think a lot of it in, is in terms of looking at policies that really respect your tax dollars. We really want to take stock of how our dollars are being mismanaged and, and put an end to the scandals that we have seen happen over the past um, the success, successive excuse me, governments. And so um, one of the ideas uh, uh, put forth in the platform is really around fiscal accountability. And so that we are, we're looking to find those efficiencies because obviously we, we can save dollars in a lot of ways and, and big ways and small ways. And, and having that office of management looking to save about 0.5% of the uh, budget annually, that's a $600 million savings that we can find in the province when we are working effectively and efficiently. And I think the important thing for me is just really thinking about making the decisions that respect your tax dollars because we are, this burden is not what we want to pass on. So I think it's really, uh, it's, it's timely, it's all costed out here, I have it on paper and uh, I'll have it at the back and I really invite people to take a look uh, to see you know, how we have planned out the revenues and the savings that are possible and also still be investing in the province rather than just cutting and firing. Thank you. For this question, it will be directed to Mr. Milligan, and so is the other candidates have the opportunity to reply. We'll have one minute for this question. Please explain what Mr. Hudak means by cutting the upper bureaucrats in schools, etc. Yeah, it's very good. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, being a former high school teacher, this is near and dear to my heart. And one of the things I'm, I'm proud to say is the fact that I stood up in caucus and when I spoke to Tim and when I was the deputy critic to education, I said, where we need to make cuts isn't on the front lines. We have to make the cuts at the bureaucratic level. If you go down to Peterborough and uh, Fisher Drive, you'll see the Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board there. Um, it's, a, it's a huge building. 
And um, what, I've, what I've stood up for and said, we need to make sure that uh, frontline uh, education is a priority. There are going to be, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you smokes and mirrors, there are gonna be some difficult choices, but I think at the bureaucratic level, um, that's, that's where we're gonna make uh, most, of our, uh, most of our decisions, uh, trimming some of the fat. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, thank you, that's an excellent question. Let me tell you, I hear that every day at the door. Uh, and uh, I'm surprised Mr. Milligan says that uh, it's only at the upper crust because that's not what your leader is saying. And as a matter of fact, he made some corrections. He says, yes, teachers are included. So you should really check with uh, his notes and make sure you line up. Yes, firefighters, um, teachers, uh, ambulance folks, uh, water inspectors, they're all included. 100,000. The, the, the challenge is, it's not just 100,000. The spin-off from the 100,000 will be probably about 150, and these numbers come from economists, not me. So all I'm saying is, it's a scary, scary, scary thought. Thank you. Ms. Mies? Like I said before, I, I, I believe we can find efficiencies, but I, I think it's dangerous just to go in and blindly set a target of cutting positions. Uh, my previous position, I worked in special education, and around 40% of principals reported asking students with special education to stay home because they didn't have the supports that they needed for them to attend school. This is an embarrassment and it's, it's a shame. So I, I think we need to look at our education system, but we need to invest in it because the children that are going to school here at CDHS and across the province deserve more than what we're giving them. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, I think that education is something that is beyond price. Uh, and I think that the, the Liberals' freeze on education spending is, 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 not, um, is not sustainable. Um, we are in a global economy. Our students need to be able to compete on a, a completely different level than, than, than most of us would have thought. Was, was necessary when, when we started out our careers. So the fact that we now rank 13th in math performance, not so good. And that's down from when we were in seventh position in 2006. So whatever it takes, our kids need to get the absolute best education that we possibly can give them. Thank you. This next question is directed to Mr. Rinaldi. Others can have the opportunity to comment. Can please explain to me why agriculture is not important enough to have its own minister? Well, um, agriculture is very important. And I think when you have a, the premier that's minister of agriculture, that's doubly important. Uh, because I can tell you the attention that it gets from the premier's office, it's way more than it gets from uh, uh, an individual minister's office. So um, I can tell you, uh, and and I know that firsthand uh, because uh, I, although I'm, I'm not a city member, but I've also been doing some work uh, with caucus, uh, liberal caucus in the premier's office, the comments I get about the advantage of having the premier as being the minister of agriculture, um, it's been uh, overwhelming. Um, so I, I'm not sure that it's a disadvantage. I think it's a huge advantage. Ms. Mies? I'm going to uh, respectfully disagree and say that uh, it's an important ministry that really needs its own skill set and it really needs someone who has the experience to, to talk to stakeholders, to bring the right people to the table and to make sure that the really specific issues that impact farmers and rural businesses understand what they're working with and so I uh, I really do think that it deserves uh, the, that attention that it needs. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, really, come on. That's like a double whammy, being the Premier and being the Minister of Agriculture. That's like just, just huge. So absolutely, um, having a dedicated uh, individual who will take on that portfolio. One of the things that we did with my organization called Sustainable Coburg is we work with a partner uh, called Sustain Ontario, and we helped 
um, sort of forge the Local Food Act through a lot of uh, telephone conversations and conferences. But really, what 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 we think should happen is that there should be a lot more interministerial conversations because transportation impacts agriculture, health impacts agriculture. So we need to have much more of an integrated approach to that particular portfolio. Thank you. Agriculture is the number uh, two employer for all of Ontario. Uh, this is this is extremely important to the Ontario economy, and why the Premier feels that she had to take on the role of Agriculture and Foods Minister is beyond me. Because being Premier, trust me, when I look at uh, Mr. Hudak running around and his schedule and the time that he allots and meeting people and all that, uh, he doesn't have time to do anything else but focus on his job as the opposition leader. Uh, I can only imagine what the Premier's job is, so to not have a full-time agricultural minister I think is a slap in the face to uh, rural Ontario. And in fact, um, you know, we've illustrated this and the Premier has shown this by closing the agricultural courses in Kempville. Uh, this is a scandal, it's a shame. Uh, we're going to lose the expertise that we need to make agriculture and food production in the province uh, sustainable locally, and uh, they should be ashamed of themselves. Thank you. This question is again for Mr. Rinaldi. Are the Liberals going to give Kempville College two million for two million dollars for a band-aid solution, only not to accept new students in the fall and then close the college? After all, it was the farmers that fed the country during the Depression and the war. Excellent question. You'll have and two minutes for this question. Sorry. Thank, thank you. Excellent question. So. Um, just so you know, going back to the uh, uh, 80s, the government that they, uh, Kempville College was part, part of the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. They, they moved that ministry to colleges and universities, so they took it off the Ministry of Agriculture's portfolio and shifted over. So that's done. Secondly, uh, University of Guelph, which is responsible for, as a campus, uh, Kempville is a campus of uh, uh, University of Guelph, made a decision because of low enrollment to close Campville College. They did. The University of Guelph did. The Premier and the Minister of, uh, of uh, Colleges University, Brad Duguid, stepped in right away and tried to look a solution. So today, the Ministry, uh, the, sorry, yes, the, uh, the, the Ministry of, of College University put in $2 million to keep the doors open while there's a local group uh, of agricultural folks the local municipalities and other colleges and universities to see how they could keep uh, Campbell College sustainable to, to support the agricultural sector. Um, even though, uh, you know, government is a lame duck this month, but that committee, that group is working and hopefully looking for a solution uh, by the fall. So there's no intent of closing Campbell College. As a matter of fact, the government and the minister stepped in immediately within a week to try to find solution, and they did put in the $2 million to help uh, the process along, make sure that it carries on. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Uh, first of all, I mean, the reason that, that uh, students don't attend is because they don't see a future in it. So, I mean, we're, we're really dropping the ball there in terms of showing agriculture as a viable um, not just a viable way of earning a living, but a lifestyle. Um, it, I mean, it's just uh, indicative to the, the rural community that, um, that young people know that they can survive, make a living, pay their taxes, raise their families by um, knowing that their skills and their knowledge uh, are going to help them to uh, promote that particular profession. Um, if, if Students aren't going to a specific course. It's, you know, they know something. So what is it that, that we're not able to uh, support in our agricultural community to let uh, all farmers know that they're valued and that, uh, that they're going to be able to um, survive? Thank you. Mr. Milligan. Yeah, again, um, you know, the $2 million that uh, Mr. Duguid uh, injected into um, uh, 
supposedly keeping Kempville College afloat uh, has been directed to courses that uh, have nothing to do with agriculture specifically. It's not ag-driven courses that received any of the funding. And what we're seeing and what's happening, and uh, we're seeing uh, students aren't able to uh, register for a two-year program, which most of the ag programs are at Kempville. So um, they're, they're saying, oh, well, you'll have to go somewhere else. What should have happened is, and it could have happened under uh, Premier Wynne, especially as agriculture minister, is they should have said to Guelph when they're, because where does the money come from for universities and colleges? comes primarily from the provincial government. They should have allocated specific funding to Kentville College as a satellite college and said, no, this portion of the money that we're giving you to run Guelph University has to be directed to agriculture and Kentville College specifically. That's what I would have done if I was the agricultural minister. I wouldn't have just said, our hands are tied, we're going to let the agricultural expertise in this province dry up and go somewhere else. Because once we lose the expertise of farming, it's not like we sit down on stools any longer behind your cow and, and use your hands to pull teats, right? This is high tech, high industry um, that we're talking about. GPS fertilization systems that students learn on at schools. There's the uh, brand new um, dairy facility that's at Kempville right now that the Dairy Farmers of Ontario and the community raised over $300,000 to build, to keep there, and they just want to shut it down. It's a travesty. This Liberal government does not care about rural Ontario. Plain and simple. Thank you. Ms. Mies? Ms. Weaver's comments because I really do think that the low enrollment is partially responsible. The, the, what's responsible for that is that people are just feeling that they can't make a go of it. And, and that is really sad. Uh, and it's not what we need here in our, our county and in, in this riding, and it's definitely not what we, need, what we need in the province. And so I really do think it's a two-fold thing. You know, we do need to support these programs because we can't have this uh, educational opportunity lost. We really do need to keep pace and keep that expertise, uh, you know, keep the students at learning. But at the same time, farmers need to know, young farmers need to know that they can make a living. That they, and, and I think farmers themselves, you know, looking at their kids, they want to know that this is something they want to bring their sons and daughters along on. You know, it, it's not uh, it's not an easy an easy lifestyle, and so I think we need to ensure that it is something that's viable for families, and uh, a key piece of it really is the education. Thank you. This is our final of the written questions. You'll have two minutes to respond, and we'll start with Ms. Weaver. Fiscal stability at the municipal level concerns many rural citizens. How would your government deal with cost sharing between levels of government? And what transfers, investment program, or investment programs do you believe require change or continued support in the coming years? Holy Hannah. That's why two minutes. Okay. Um, well, interministerial, intergovernmental communication, um, being collaborative, not being confrontational, um, having guidelines being specific, um, not, not allowing um, situations to be manipulated. So um, the, the Ontario Municipal Board and, and what that stands for and how that works and how municipalities um, can um, evolve, um, it, it, it's, it's such a convoluted and, and um, strategic kind of question. And I don't know if there's any one specific answer without actually going to ask people and saying, you know, what do you, what do you want to see? How do you want to see this work? What, what's the best practices that, that you think are going to be uh, relevant for, for um, the kind of vision that you have? So there has to be consultation as far as I'm concerned. I don't think it can be a top-down solution. I think that people need to feel that their voice is heard. Uh, they need to be validated. Um, and I, I think that's what good democracy does. And I think that through many diverse conversations, you come up with some really profound, good solutions. Anyway, that's my hope. Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yeah, obviously, you know, um, um, 
being a, an elected official to represent the, um, our region at the provincial level, it's my job to work with the municipalities in North Armand and Quinney West, and I think that we've had a, a very good, um, uh, very good relationship so far. Even though I'm sitting in opposition, it's a little hard for myself to um, to uh, sort of claw some some dollars for the municipalities. But one of the things that we're proposing and and uh, and across Ontario, not just here in, in Trent Hills or Northumberland and the West, is um, a greater share of the gas revenue um, to go to municipalities so that they can meet their infrastructure requirements. Um, so what we're seeing now, the way the gas revenue is sort of divvied up, is if you do not have um, a public transit in, in your municipality, you don't get a um, uh, portion of, of, of that uh, gas tax revenue. There are currently 88 municipalities in the province that don't receive gas tax revenue from the province. Uh, we just think that it's fair, particularly in rural Ontario, that you get a greater uh, uh, portion of that gas tax revenue. Uh, so because, of course, population base and out here in rural Ontario, it just makes sense because we have to drive um, everywhere we go. We spend a lot of money on fuel to get to our destinations, our products to market. So it's just, to me, it makes sense that that's one, one revenue stream that we have to tap into to make sure that our infrastructure is met. Thank you. Ms. Mies? I think basically what municipalities need is secure multi-year <coughs> funding because they need to know and be able to make plans and understand like which roads need to be fixed and which water means need to be replaced. It's a pretty simple formula to make it a successful relationship between the province and the municipalities. I think organizations like the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association understanding that they are an effective group, like they understand what's happening at the rural level and what municipalities need and I think that the province needs to consult those stakeholders and really get get the information right from them, but I really think the key is multi-year funding because there's no way you can make plans going on a year-by-year -year basis. And municipalities, their income stream is our, our tax bills and, and user fees. And so we really want to make sure that those those dollars, they have those to use, but when, when infrastructure and big build projects like a multi-use recreational facility perhaps, um, when those kind of dollars are needed, we need to expect that the province is going to come to the plate and and play ball. And that's really what needs to happen. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Well, thank you. Uh, as Ms. Mies indicated before, sometimes we do agree on certain things. She talked, she talked about sustainable funding. Uh, the sad part is in today's platform, I didn't see any sustainable funding for municipalities, for okay. roads, bridges, sure. or, or transit anywhere. Uh, it's not spelled out anywhere. But absolutely, municipalities, I mean, I was municipal in municipal life for, for some 12 years, and that's one of the things I, I screamed about all the time. So what happened a couple of weeks ago when the, the two opposition parties decided not to support the budget, there was $130 million a year for 10 years. So talk about long-term planning, this was 10 years, not a one-time deal. $130 million for a total of $14 billion for rural municipalities outside of Toronto, Hamilton area for so that they can plan, uh, and, and plus programs that we're able to partner with, with municipalities. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure most of us will remember, I mean, I was there, I think some of the politicians, were, uh, when the former government downloaded everything to municipalities, I can tell you there were municipalities in this province that almost declared bankruptcy. I know of two of them that the province had to help out because they were going to go bankrupt. So there's been an enormous amount of uploading of services that were downloaded, with no very little supports, um, th but there's got to be more done because I know that there's only one taxpayer, and I tell you, uh, I didn't pick a fight with municipalities when I was uh, an MPP. I worked with municipalities for a special challenge, whether it was a flood, whether it was a bridge, whether it was a, a sewage treatment facility, whether it was a recreation center, they always had a phone that they can pick up and talk to, and I, I, I certainly try to help them. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now take a five-minute break. Resume at 8.15.
ask a question to the candidates, and please come forward to the microphone and state whether it's directed to all the candidates or one in particular. Again, each candidate will have the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. I was certainly glad to hear the support for our local hospitals and uh, our local hospital and nurse practitioners from all of you. I think I heard policy there. Um, Ms. Weaver, I don't know you. I don't think we've ever met. I don't know you. The other, the other three of you, uh, I've had a, a, an excellent working relationship with you and uh, in different, different matters. And I uh, look forward to working with one of you in the future. Um, keeping the focus of the cost of electricity in mind, and you're, most of you are likely aware of the Trent Hills Council's effort to uh, convince the Ombudsman to investigate Hydro One, which I've also asked him to continue on and investigate uh, OPG, the Green Energy Act, and so on. I believe that the staff at the provincial government is out of touch with rural Ontario and has been for a very, very long time. In the interest of time, if you could. Move and the question the is. Rather than coming up with new revenue generating tools, which what was being proposed for municipalities, I've asked that the provincial government look at redistribution of the dollars they already receive. Will you support, on behalf of rural Ontario, specifically for Eastern Ontario, my colleagues at the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus, for a comprehensive service delivery review, including uh, municipal, and public consultation to see exactly what it is that Ontarians expect, what we want funded, in particular the cost of electricity, and what we're willing to live with, and most importantly, what we're willing to pay. We'll allow two minutes for a response for this question. Mr. Milligan, if you could start. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Your Worship, for the question. Uh, it's uh, good to see you here, and I know you're a huge advocate for this. Uh, we've, we've had discussions on this uh, previously, and I'm glad that you uh, uh, wrote the Ombudsman uh, uh, to uh, investigate Hydro One and OPG, because those are two areas I think that you're absolutely right. We need to um, have a comprehensive review as to uh, what has happened to uh, the cost of electricity in the province of Ontario, and uh, why we're in the situation we are now. Uh, because we know for a fact, and when I, when I travel through the riding and listen to the manufacturers and, and even, more importantly, the residents here, uh, their electricity is number one. It's paramount. Uh, and if we're going to attract uh, manufacturing back to the province, we have to make energy a priority and affordable so that we can sustain those jobs here. Uh, so absolutely, I would support uh, that initiative. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, uh to me, it just makes common sense that if there's a problem, you get people together to look at what the problem is and try to work out different perspectives and work in collaboration to find a solution. So, yes, definitely would support any kind of um, attempt to, in a collaborative way, in a way that is respectful, obviously, to other people's needs and, and their their um, perspective on what's important because different different factions have different views on what it is that, that they want to accomplish. So you have to have the dialogue, you have to have the conversation. You have to have a moderator that is going to be able to, you know, like a conductor orchestrate it so everybody's voice is heard. Um, so thank you for doing that. My very courageous and very uh, very um, unique for for people to, to stand up the way that you have, sir. Ms. Mies? Um, absolutely. I mean, to me, uh, it just makes sense that from time to time, and especially in times like this, when we've seen uh, disrespect for tax dollars and mismanagement and scandal, that that's the time to do a review like that. And I think that Given the important work that the municipality does on behalf of the province and those dollars that, you know, uploading and downloading and all the ways those, the dollars have gone back and forth, I think it's, it's a, a, a great idea. And it sounds like a, it might even be a job for the uh, Minister of Savings and Accountability that uh, Andrea put forth on the platform today. I mean, it, it's something that needs to be, to be addressed. Mr. Rinaldi? 
Well, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, first of all, in the abutment piece, uh, I congratulate you and your council for, uh, for taking that initiative. And I'm sure, regardless of who gets elected, uh, on June the 12th, that, uh, that the, the government of the day will take those ombudsman recommendations and, uh, and uh, move forward with them, whatever they may be. And I don't want to sit here and speculate. I know the ombudsman is, in general has done a fantastic job for people of Ontario. So whoever is fortunate enough from government, I think uh, they should uh, certainly uh, endorse uh, his recommendation and move forward. On the service delivery piece, uh, uh, Hector, uh, Eastern Ontario Wardens are the most organized municipal organization in the province and I had the privilege of, uh, of uh, working well, with you when you were a warden and other wardens in Northumberland County and you brought forward, uh, uh, the, oh, the, uh, the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus brought, brought forward of, uh, a lot of good suggestions, a lot of good ideas. You know, we, a lot of us wouldn't have high-speed internet if it wasn't for you guys in, uh, in Eastern Ontario. So. Uh, so when it comes to a relook at what you folks brought forward as, as East Ontario Wardens a few years back, uh, yeah, every, every uh, I don't think just once, but every five years, every uh, eight years, seven years, I'm not sure what the number is, uh, but certainly, and that's, and that's with everything. So, and, uh, uh, and whatever, like I say, uh, and I think the government should really pay attention to the wardens uh, because they represent the people closest to them. Uh, as municipal politicians, so uh, I would welcome the opportunity to talk on that in your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Peter Lustro, and I'm a diabetic, and my question is for Mr. Rinaldi, although I'd like the other candidates to also chime in on. Uh, as a diabetic, I test my blood four times a day. Whenever I go to my doctor, he gives me a prescription and I get my strips along with my medications. Why is your government cut those strips in half so that I can only test every two days now or every three days? Now it's very important that I know what my blood sugars are every day so that I can adjust my meals and adjust my medications to that. Your government is taking half of those strips Thank away. Thank you. 300. Well, Peter, I, uh, uh, yeah, I you know certainly understand where you're coming from. I don't have an, a, a straight answer. I'm not a doctor, and I wasn't part of you know when when that happened. So I, I don't want to give you uh, a uh, a false answer. Uh, but what I'd be more than happy to do if you see me afterwards with your name and number, I will certainly you know do some inquiry and you know, I'll get back to you. The other thing that I also like to point out, though, that back a few years, uh, you know, 2005, I believe 2006. Uh, you know, the insulin pump program got expanded to people that take insulin uh, for free. That, you know, in the past you, you would have had to pay. But uh, on the strip part, I, you know, I don't have an answer for you tonight. And I'm not a doctor, so it'd be foolish for me to comment. I'd be more than happy to look into it and certainly get back to you. And, if, and I will add to that, and if, some that, if I was fortunate to be reelected on the, in, on the 12th of June, and if it's something that's really important, I'd like to carry on the conversation. And obviously, if it's, I'm sure it's not just you, it's other folks like you as well that I would like to champion for that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mies? I would just uh, say that it's one of those cuts that is kind of a, a short-term gain that just really leads to long-term long problems. You know, it's really kind of a short-sighted thing because we know that in your health, not testing and not having that blood sugar even really just leads to, to more problems and so it's really short term thinking and I think there's a lot of gaps like that right now in our healthcare where people are really, you know, something like going to dialysis and spending six or eight hundred dollars a month to go back and forth to dialysis, that's a really, uh, it's, it's just a, a short sighted thing that really leads to long term pain for people who are already dealing with health concern so I think some common sense needs to come back into those uh, the funding and how those things work because I think we think short term a lot in politics and uh, we end up paying in the long run. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Well, thank you for your story and uh, I'm sure that's a, a story that is not just unique to you but it just simply shows to me how we lose sight of the human being that we're trying to 
help um, by looking at numbers and you know slashing this and saving four dollars and twenty five cents here and so on. So somehow or other, the, the focus, rather than being on health, is on something else. So the Greens absolutely 100% focus on health, well-being. That is a priority that is not negotiable. Um, your well-being is what makes uh, a community, what makes people feel that, you know, that there's there's a, a, the communities there to support them and that they feel safe, that they know that they can have the medical care that they need without any compromise. So, thank you for bringing that story to us. Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yeah, Peter, thank you so much because this is important. Uh, when I was the member and, uh, you know, having meetings with constituents in my uh, Trenton and Coburg offices, there were, there were hundreds who either called in, emailed, or, or came in to me about this cut that the Liberals uh, um, implemented with uh, with regards to the, um, the strips that you use. And it's not a matter of if it's important, Peter, as, my, as Mr. Rinaldi pointed out. This is extremely important, and I've brought this up with Christine Elliott, our health critic, and Christine agrees that this is, um, uh, diabetes is on the rise, as you well know. And, it, and, and I'd like to point out, uh, you know, I agree with what uh, Kira is saying, the MDP candidate, um, my good friend, because um, it, it is going to lead to potential uh, greater health issues for yourself and all the other individuals who have to do those scripts. So I'm working with Christine Elliott on that and we're looking on our reviews. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Marlena Sculthorpe. I live in Port Hope and I'm married to a beef farmer. And the question I have touches on everything we've discussed tonight, the Green Energy Act, um, health, environment, protecting rural farmland and supporting young farmers. Uh, my question is, uh, for the western end of this riding, incineration is going to be a major election issue. What is your party's stance on waste to energy facilities, uh, whether they call it incineration or gasification? Would you actively support citizens who are opposed to such a project? We'll start with Ms. Mies. Um, hi, Marlene. I have, uh, I've met with the um, management Oh, their name, then I think they're short form in my head. The Concerned Citizens from Port Hope, we'll call them. I had a, a meeting with them and talked to them about this incineration project. And, and there, I have some big concerns about the project, uh, and probably far more than I can do in however long it's going to take Don to, to put that sign up. Just starting from the fact that it's a private company who's going to be paying people to truck dozens and dozens and dozens of, of trucks of unknown, garbage of unknown origin to our, our county. Just talking about bioaccumulation in the soil and the impact of farming and health and not even to mention another layer of stigma on Port Hope around, you know, a, a place to dump garbage. I have personal concerns about this and I think at the very least a full environmental assessment needs to happen um, and that is even if um, it's allowed to go through in the first place and I know that um, important meetings are coming up in the next few weeks about that to see if council is going to support the project and uh, thank you and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Weaver? Well the short the short answer is no we would not support that simply because it's a health risk. Uh, it's an untried system in, in North America. It's about um, you know too many risk factors that we don't have any real answers for, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the size of the project is, is a little scary too. So anything that is going to um, jeopardize the health of our citizens, the air that we breathe, the, the land that, that we grow things, no, that's, that's not, comp not a compromise at all. Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yeah, I, I also um, do not support uh, this particular project, the Remnant Tech project, uh, as um, my green candidate and friend pointed out that um, you know this is an unproven technology. Uh, this particular facility, um, I have met with uh, your mother-in-law uh, twice and, and the group twice, uh, once informally at the farm and, and once uh, collectively as a whole. Um, I wrote uh, Minister Bradley. Mr. Bradley is the environmental minister with my concerns on this. I have not heard from Mr. Bradley and that was uh, over eight months ago. 
Um, so the Liberals are sitting on their hands with regards to this. Uh, also, I, I arranged a, a meeting with Gord Miller, who is the Environmental Commissioner for the province of Ontario. Uh, and also, um, you know, I encouraged the group when I sat down with them to <clears throat> get in touch with, uh, with um, the financial backers of Bullfrog Energy and uh, write letters as I did. But the Durham facility is only running at 60% capacity, so how they're going to get um, enough material... Thank you, Mr. Mulligan. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, thank you for the question. I tell you, I spent an enormous amount of uh, time in wearing my shoes in Port Hope in the last few days, and uh, that's the number one issue at the door. So, um, and I've been talking with the group, uh, as you're probably aware, uh, on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, I met uh, uh, with Mrs. Calthorpe yesterday in my uh, Port Hope office. Uh, so, um, I was saving this for Port Hope, but I'll do whatever humanly possible, whatever humanly possible. Uh, if I'm so successful on the 12th, I'm not going to dance around. Uh, I've delivered before in the community, and I will deliver again. Uh, I'll give you my word, I'll try my best, I cannot promise, but I'll, give my, but I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, the community doesn't want what other part don't we understand? The community, and knowing some of the history, Port Hope, with other issues that, that it has, uh, you know, we don't need another. So, thank you. You can report back. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Alan Appleby. I'm from Camelford. And uh, I'll address this question to uh, all the candidates, but maybe uh, Mr. Milligan could start. Um, there's been a, a huge burden of infrastructure and social service and other costs downloaded onto municipalities. In their 2014 budget presentation, Northumberland County shows that 48% of their budget is made up of costs downloaded from the provincial government. Uh, the county level, levy uh, for Trent Hills is if you could just get to the question. approximately one-third of the total budget. So, what would you do to address this situation? In other words, uh, to provide uploading and or financial support for these services um, that uh, were summarily uh, dumped in our laps. We'll allow two minutes for this question. Mr. Milligan? Thank you, Alan, for the, uh, the question. Obviously, infrastructure is, is a massive and, and social services are, are extremely important to our communities. Infrastructure, uh, currently in Canada there's a, over a hundred and ten billion dollar shortfall uh, of funding for infrastructure and Ontario of course makes up a, a huge chunk of, of that uh, infrastructure shortfall. So um, uh, what we're sort of planning to do, and I, I uh, sort of addressed this earlier with uh, the gas tax revenue for municipalities, and I agree with uh, Kira, there has to be some kind of projected sustainable funding that municipalities know they're going to have ahead of time, this year by year, not knowing exactly um, how much money they're going to get. Um, I would like to see that, uh, well, that gas uh, revenue, gas tax revenue, would be a sustainable allotted monies to the municipalities and, and counties so that they uh, can put that money to uh, infrastructure and social, social services that are, that are required. Um, but right now, we're on the wrong path. I mean, uh, if we keep digging this financial hole and debt um, further into the ground, I mean, we're already spending $2 million an hour uh, to service the interest. If, if, if the interest uh, on the debt uh, had a ministry, it would be the third largest ministry next to health care and education. This is, this is crippling. It's going to be crippling for our ability financially to put the money back into infrastructure and the social services that we require. Two million dollars an hour that comes out of social services and infrastructure. And it's going to get worse if we don't change course. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's such a sad, sad story because it's the small communities, it's the small municipalities that really are the driving force in Ontario. So not to have, you know, the support that you need to keep them healthy and keep them viable and keep them functioning, it just boggles the mind. So what's the solution? Is the solution always about money? Or is the solution about being innovative? Is the solution about, um, creating 
different kinds of forums to, to come to come to solutions. I think the answer is money is limited no matter where you go. I mean, Lou was pointing out we're in a global, we have been in a global recession. I think in Canada we've done amazingly well. Um, I'm glad. <laughs> I, I love Greece, but I'm, I'm glad that we, we don't have to face the problems that they have to face. But one, one of the things that I think needs to happen is just an honest look at the problem and uh, looking at the stakeholders and, and what they really want to achieve. And that means that you need to come to the table, you know, put on your, put your best foot forward and just say, you know, bottom line is, you know, we need infrastructure money. We need to have ways of, of securing uh, capital for capital expenses. And how are we going to do that? And there has to be innovative ways of, of finding those solutions when, when people come to the table and not the same old, same old, same old. Thank you. Ms. Mies? Um, I think there, there is a kind of a two-fold approach in my mind. And one is to really stop wasting dollars. It seems kind of simple, but, you know, the, this last government that has really impacted us with this, this deficit that we have has, has really been a lot of waste and mismanagement. So I think that has to stop. And I also think we suffer from short-term thinking. And this infrastructure deficit that we are facing is from years of neglect. And we tend to think in these little two and four year ways. You know, and, and it's not the way to go. And it is, you know, it's innovative thinking. But unfortunately, we can't just um, have these budgets that are based around getting elected. We can't make promises just to get these votes and then and let down future generations and leave them on the hook with crumbling infrastructure. And so it is kind of a philosophical answer to your question, but I really think we need to shift the way we're working and we need to start planning long-term. That means municipals, municipalities have long-term funding so that they can plan ahead and, and make these investments that need to happen, uh, and that we can slowly chip away at this debt of infrastructure that we have and, and crumbling roads and bridges and buildings. Those, those, that problem's not gonna go away. And so the only thing that we can do is start thinking in a longer-term way so that the solutions are there when we need them. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi? Well, Helen, I'm not sure you can the answer that you asked for. Uh, I think you're looking for some specifics. So, um, look, the, the down, you know, you refer to some downloading, I know Mayor uh, McMillan sent, gave me some uh, papers uh, a couple months ago, and I was uh, looking for my information about the, uh, what seems to be the downloading piece. The present government took on uploading when we formed government in 2003. We did an enormous amount of, uh, of uploading uh, that was, frankly, downloaded like highways, like Highway 30, Highway 28, and I could go on and on and on and on. Uh, social services dumped all in the hands of the municipalities. A lot of the stuff, uh, you know, it's been taken over by the province. But you know what? Times changed over the last seven or eight years, and I think uh, Mayor McMillan pointed out quite you know, eloquently that now there seems to be uh, other pressures that are, are, are going backwards. Hence, I agreed with them that we need this review like we did. You know, that review that for the uploading was done with AMO, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs. And finally, the province, you know, did all that work. So I think it's time to do that again. Uh, the sad part is that in between, there was a budget presented two or three weeks ago with $130 million to, for municipal infrastructure a year for 10 years that, you know, would certainly take some of those pressures off. Uh, the Premier made very, very clear that's our platform. And, and if we're fortunate enough to form government, that, that budget is going to be reintroduced on June the 13th, hypothetically, but shortly after. So the commitment is there. We understand the pressure municipalities are under. 
And we, we are, I agree with you, but we need to do the review to see what we did it before, we're prepared to do it again. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Um, I know two of the four. Uh, my name is Landon, and I'm still in high school, and I don't have to worry about the same problems that my parents do. And one of those problems going way back to the beginning is electricity and energy and stuff. And so, primarily, I'm not going to have to worry about paying my bills for another, I don't know, five or six years until I'm done school. But my parents have to worry about that, and so I'll have to worry about that because they helped me get through school. And so, Miss Weaver, you said at the very beginning that you're not, your park is not going to worry about um, refurbishing the nuclear power plants in Ontario. Did you not say that? All right, well, I'm going to continue with my question anyways. Thank you. Um, so I know just from common sense that nuclear energy has way more of an impact on like our society today than any like uh, sustainable energy like so windmills and solar energy like that will. So I want to know how, um, well, any of you guys can answer, but any party can fix like the energy crisis related to nuclear power plants and like keeping that sustainable or putting the money into like windmills and solar power and stuff like that. Thank you. I'll yeah. start with uh, Ms. Weaver. Well, nuclear, no matter how much money we throw at it, it just keeps getting more expensive. Solar, wind, geothermal, getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So when you look at it that way on balance, what is more economical to invest your money in? Something that is constantly sucking money and, and, and still isn't at a level where we feel comfortable in terms of safety. What's not safe about solar? What's not safe about geothermal? There's no threat, there's less cost. Um, it, it, it's a renewable energy. Uh, it, it just makes so much sense. And of course, when I was in China, practically every building had a solar panel. Uh, wind turbines everywhere in, in Germany. So, you know what? They've figured something out that is working for them. And the population... Thank you. Okay. Mr. Milligan. Well, Landon, um, I'm proud to say that I taught Landon, and obviously he's an extremely wise and uh, well-informed individual. I don't know if that came from my, my end or not, but uh, no, no, no. I knew he was exceptional when he was young. Uh, in my class, but um, obviously, uh, Landon, thank you for the question. And nuclear is going to be key uh, if we're going to, again, uh, create uh, a sustainable and affordable, sustainable being the key word there, and affordable, right, um, uh, energy here in the province of Ontario. Right now, um, the you know, when we, we're proposing to rebuild the nuclear uh, fleet, refurbish what's there and rebuild, that's, that's four cents a kilowatt hour versus, you know, wind and solar, which has cost uh, $20 billion the Liberal government has put in. They want to add another two-thirds to that. Uh, $20 billion, uh, Landon, at a million dollars an hour if we were to burn that, uh, it would take 65 years. So you'd be in a, a long-term care facility if we had any back uh, up at, at that time uh, before that's even Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi. Well, thank you, Landon, and thank you for two of you being here tonight because you just lower your average age drastically. So, can you bring some friends with you next time? I think it's very crucial. So, thank you for being here. Look, uh, the Liberal Party of Ontario has always believed that we have to have a, a mix. Uh, we're committed. Uh, 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 nuclear provides about 50% of the power, roughly, of the power that we use every day. And we're committed to keep the 50% mix. As a matter of fact, we're committed to refurbish some, uh, some reactors to make sure that they work and we have light. But we also believe in, in on the future, an investment in the future, and that's where the green energy comes into play, solar and wind. I mean, I think we destroyed our planet enough so far, and I know some people look at that as a waste of money, as uh, Mr. Milgram, Mr. Turek would say. I call it, and I got that from one of your friends at the NSS the other day, that said that that's an investment. And I agree with the young gentleman. That's an investment for his future, because we're probably not going to be around to see what's going to happen in this world, but your kids, you and your kids and grandkids might see that. So I think we need a real Thank you. Mix. Thank you. Ms. Mies. I need. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's speedy. So, um, hi, Landon. Nice hi. to see you. Um, I think that 
it's, it's really about a mix. Uh, the NDP recognizes that, uh, like Mr. Rinaldi said, 50% uh, comes from nuclear energy, but we really do think that in terms of investments and moving forward, we really need to do some diversification of our energy. So we do support the refurbishment, although we don't really think we want to be investing in new nuclear builds, although really around the world, it's not really happening all that much. So I just think that we need to recognize that it is uh, a, it is part of our energy structure, but moving forward, we really are, are looking to help families invest in their own energy production so that you can have a, uh, a rebate from the energy that you're producing, and we have, we have a, a, a plan for that. Thank you. My name is Bob Brown, and I'm a farrier, and I've been directly affected by the Liberals cutting out the OLG slots, funding to the horses. I want to know if that's planning to come back because you've lost probably three million dollars or better on a rough estimate in uh, money that would have come in from the slots had the racing been going on. And it's directly affecting all the farmers in this area because it's kind of like uh, almost Lexington North here when it comes to racing. We'll start with Mr. Rinaldi. Sure. Well, Bob, thanks for the question. And look, the racing industry has been an important part of Ontario, the horse racing industry. And uh, there were some challenges. And I met with horsemen and breeders prior to what happened uh, a year, year and a half ago. And they told me themselves that there were some huge challenges and some action needed to be taken. Uh, and, and the reality is, I think, you probably read it. Uh, I read it that some uh, operations like Woodbine or, or some others like, uh, they kept two sets of books. And uh, so some had to happen. How it started, it probably wasn't the right way, and I'll be the first one to admit it, but I think today, we've, we're, with what's happening, we've, we're establishing a sustainable horse racing industry that'll be here for years. Because it could not be sustained the way it was, and I think uh, I'm correct in saying that I saw you nod that uh, some of the racetrack operators were being a little bit greedy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Milligan? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, Bob. Um, quite bluntly, um, there, there did need to be some tweaking. As we all know, I met with the horse racing industry numerous times, went to numerous tracks, but you just don't kill the industry, That's right? right? Um, you sit down and you listen to what they have to say and you iron out uh, any, any problems that are there. You just don't go ahead and implement uh, and get rid of this lots of racetracks uh, program. And you're right, we lost $3 million in revenue because of that. We've also lost upwards of 35,000 jobs in rural Ontario and, we've, and then the Liberals have killed 9,000 horses. So, um, will we work with, uh, with the horse racing industry in rural Ontario to make sure that it's sustainable and profitable again for you folks? Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Mies? This is another time when we're a little bit in agreement, Mr. Milligan. Uh, it is, uh, it's unfortunate what happened to the industry and, and I know that uh, most folks who work on the farms with the horses, they did it for the love. They, they weren't, they weren't um, raking in uh, buckets of money. And so it's unfortunate that for um, some mismanagement and some, you know, that, that's really, that, that, the, that you're suffering for that is, is unfortunate. And I think that bringing the stakeholders to the table and making the adjustments that need to happen is really the way to go because it's an important industry here in Northumberland but across the province. And I think that, you know, with proper attention and uh, the input from, the, from all of you who are part of the industry is, is what needs to happen. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? So this is about livelihood. Of course. This is about it's property. A, this it's is about, about spin-off industry. It's about manufacturing. Please the answer. Thank you. Yeah. So, but and, and also it's about you know a, a kind of a a, a a lifestyle that you have when when you're looking after horses and preparing them for horse races. So when part of that picture. Um, gets messed up because somebody's done something untoward and then everybody else suffers there doesn't seem like that is the way that it should go so obviously things have to be looked at 
things have to be reviewed. I don't think anybody's livelihood should be taken away because somebody else made, uh, you know, misjudgment about certain things. So the Greens definitely would, would support your venture in the way that you have chosen to um, have your life. Thank you. If there are no more questions from the floor, we'll now proceed with the closing remarks. Each candidate will have two minutes, and we'll start with Mr. Rinaldi. Well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for the session tonight. It's a, a run for us as candidates, uh, being the first uh, public debate. We had one high school the other night, and it's always good uh, to hear comments from the floor. Uh, you know, whether we agree or disagree, but it's always uh, good input. Uh, that, uh, that I think as candidates we can know. Uh, so I'm, uh, I know we only have two minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to try to get to the point. Just a couple of clarification. I'm not sure where my friend from McGuid said that education uh, uh, budget are frozen. No, there's no such thing. You know, that's one of the budgets that keeps on going up every year. And about the level of uh, standards of education in Ontario, um, you know, they're, they're one of the best in the English-speaking world. And there's, and there's experts from around the world that are coming here to see what we do. Having said that, that's just for clarification. So, um, we have a couple of young folks here that are probably going to go to university if you're not in university already. And I know some of you have kids that might go to university somewhere down the road. There's a 30% increase in your uh, tuition fees come June 13. And that's a fact. Um, if you've got kids in grade school, the class size are going to be bigger. Uh, teacher's assistants are going to be a thing of the past, and maybe full day JK and SK might be out of the window. So, it, and that, those are facts. I'm not making that up. That's in, uh, in documentation that Mr. Hudak uh, uh, has, has brought forward. Uh, a firing of 100,000, oh no, firing of 100,000 people. My good friend, Ms. Ms. Mies here, might lose her job because she's one of those folks. My daughter might lose her job. Your kids might lose their jobs. Uh, so, and 100,000 people, folks, Mike Harris only fired 7,000 people and it was devastating. Can you imagine 100,000? So just bear that in mind. So I would say that come June 12th, yes, government had some challenges. Every government had some challenges that I can remember. I haven't seen a, a perfect uh, uh, government yet. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. But just please shop Thank and you. prepare. Thank you. Ms. Mies. Thank you. I am running to be your new Democrat MPP in Northumberland, Quinty West. And it's time for a government that is ready to stand up for the middle class. It's time for a government that's ready to make life affordable for the citizens of Ontario. And it's time for a government who is going to put an end to scandal and mismanagement. I am really honored to be here and I'm excited about this process and being up here for the next three weeks with these folks, but I really think it's important to realize that you are the most important people in this process and uh, that it's time to make a choice and I think we need to think about what our options are and I think it's time to think about what makes sense. We can't abide by the scandal of mismanagement and we can't blindly go in and make cuts and just hope it all works out in the end. 100,000 jobs cut from our public service would be devastating. And like Mr. Rinaldi said, it's going to impact people that you know and that I know, and it's going to, to change life as we know it here in this province. And so what I pledge to do as your local representative at Queen's Park is work to make a province that makes sense, to bring your concerns and the concerns of the most vulnerable members of our community the attention that they need, and uh, I ask for your support on June 12th. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Weaver? Wow. Um, being a politician is hard work. And you have to know so much stuff, really and truly. But let's face it, um, each person up here on the podium has strengths. Uh, they wouldn't be here if they didn't have those strengths. I think your job is really to figure out which of the strengths that you see up here are the ones that are going to help you achieve what you want to achieve. So there's a lot of thinking 
that you have to do on your part. We hope that we've helped you kind of sort things out from the positions that we've kind of tried to reflect to you on, on the great questions that we got. Um, you know, the Greens have never really had a shot at this, so it would be kind of cool if um, that happened. But, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not living in la-la land. I'm living in the real world. So all I'm here for you is to give you the option of seeing there is a fourth party. It's a viable party. It's got great ideas. It's got wonderful people. And at the core of the Green Party is you. You, how you see the world, uh, how you see the world for your grandchildren, let alone for your children, uh, and how much you would like to see the Greens pay a part in that vision that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Milligan. Yes, thank you very much. I want to especially thank you folks for coming out uh, this evening and uh, as, I, as I stated earlier, um, uh, in, in 07 when I was the campaign manager we only had about seven people out and then in, I think in the last campaign in 11 we had 13 out so this is remarkable. Thank you very much for being engaged. Um, I do want to defend my, my green colleague here from the comments made by Mr. Rinaldi in that um, you know uh, the standards in our education system have dropped. That's one of the reasons why I decided to leave the profession. My wife thinks I should be deinstitutionalized for giving up a pension and benefits and holidays, but um, to get into this uh, quagmire because we, we need to educate our young people to ensure that they have the proper skill sets and knowledge base to move forward and, and grow in the, in the global economy of the 21st uh, century. Um, you know, we want to make sure that our young people coming out, like Landon here this evening, uh, has a job when he comes out of post-secondary education. You know, currently right now, and I'll use education as, as an example because I'm familiar with it, if we know that there are 6,000 teachers in the province of Ontario retiring this June, why are we allowing 14,000 individuals into the BI programs? That's 8,000 students that are graduating this June, or, or have already graduated from university this year, that will not have employment. There are 87,000 unemployed, qualified teachers in the province of Ontario. We want to create jobs in, in this province. In order to do that, we need to get our energy costs under, under control. We need to attract uh, business back, a manufacturing business here. We need to protect agriculture, uh, not shut down colleges like Kempville. We need to ensure and where are we going to, you know, the fear-mongering about the 100,000, let me just give you a, a little taste. Uh, the, in, in the four years that uh, this plan will be implemented, there will be about 220,000 retirees. And we're, we're, we're just saying that there are cuts that can be made at the LINs, at the OPA level, uh, and the bureaucratic level. Thank you, Mr. Milligan. Well, that concludes this evening's All Candidates Night. Uh, for those of you who didn't have the opportunity to voice your questions, do feel free to pick up literature at the back. The candidates will be around for a few minutes uh, to answer any questions. On behalf of the Trent Hills District Chamber of Commerce, I'd like to thank the candidates for coming out and all of you for being out this evening. Thank you.